Well, good evening, church. Thank you for joining us for our Wednesday study in James. And tonight will be, uh, maybe end up being a little bit shorter. We're at James chapter 4, due in verse 13 to about 17 tonight. So not a ton of verses there, but a lot to kind of unpack and work through um, as we think about what Scripture says about this certain situation we're looking at here. Uh, and my Bible sort of describes it as our will and his will. And we think about that sort of our will versus God's will. And that is a such an interesting loaded topic when we think about it. And so often as Christians, we want to say that our will aligns with his will. But I think if we're not careful, church, what we end up doing is trying to make God's will force itself into our will, if that makes sense, you know, in a way that uh, we sort of want what we want, and we kind of try to strong-arm God, as funny as that sounds, into doing what we want or uh, giving us the things that we desire or that we want instead of looking out for what it is He would have for us. You know, we try to, met, try to move God's will to align with our own and, and sort of thinking that we know better, right? This idea of, you know, well, I'm here, and I kind of know what I'm capable of, and, and you know, God just should should realize that, and I, I kind of, I got this. And uh, especially as, as adults, I think we're, we're all sort of guilty of this, that we sort of think we have a good head on our shoulders and know what we're doing and have this whole thing figured out. And the, the truth of it is, is, I mean, I don't know about y'all, but there are days that I'm making it by the, the skin of my teeth, the edge of my pants. I'm, I'm just doing my best to make it from, from minute to minute to hour to hour. Uh, so I'll, I'll fully admit there are plenty of times in my life that Man, I don't, I don't have this thing all together, and I don't know what's going to happen. I have to trust in what God is doing and how he's moving because I don't see the next turn, let alone the next 50 feet. And so when we think about that and we look here in Scripture at James chapter 4, look starting about verse 10, it says this, Come now, you who say, Today or tomorrow we will travel to such and such a city and spend a year there and do business and make profit. You don't even know what tomorrow will bring, what your life will be. For you are a bit of smoke that appears for a little while and then vanishes. And how truthful is that to our lives today? Myself included, we make uh, these grand plans about what we're going to do in the future and, and you know, our five and ten year and one year plans and all these different plans. And the truth of it is, is we see it there that we are just a bit of smoke that appears for a moment and then is gone, vanishes. And we don't even know, 14, we don't even know what tomorrow will bring, what your life will be. You know, the idea here sort of being, don't worry about tomorrow. Focus on today. Right? We, we hear that all the time. You hear that in Scripture, right? Don't, don't focus on tomorrow. Make it through the day in front of you, right? Don't put off to tomorrow what you could do today. And we've heard this before. You've probably heard me say this at church, right? We have to be careful that we don't fall into that trap of procrastinators unite tomorrow. Because procrastination is such an easy temptation to fall into because it's easy, right? It's easy to say, ah, it'll be there tomorrow. It's easy to say, I'll get to it tomorrow or I'll get to it the next day or the day after that. And then eventually we find ourselves down the road going, oh yeah, I meant to do that and I never made it. And if we're not careful, that mentality will sneak into our relationship with Christ, right? Oh, I meant to, I meant to study that scripture today, but I just, I just didn't make it. I meant to pray, but I just got busy. I'll do it tomorrow. Or I meant to tell that person about Jesus. I'll do it next time I see him. Folks, the hard part about that one is we don't know when the last time we will see someone is. And that's a hard statement to think about. It's a hard thought to think about that, that there will come a time in your life where you will interact with someone for the last time, and you won't know that it's the last time until it's too late. As a parent, that kind of hits you between the eyes, right? As a parent of young kids, it as I was looking and studying and thinking about things, there are certain things I sort of tell you about parenthood to sort of watch out for, right? The, the idea of there might come a time in your existence as a parent that you will put your child down. You will have been holding your child, carrying your child around, and you'll put them down, and you'll never pick them up again. 
who have gotten to that point where they're just too big. Either you physically can't do it or they don't want you to or whatever. There comes these moments that you don't realize is the last of something until it is behind you. We think about what's gone on in our country this year, in our area this year. When our teachers and students came home from spring break, they didn't know that that was the last time they would spend together in a classroom. They had no idea. None of us did. We didn't know that the last time for two months that we were going to meet was a couple of weeks in March. I bet you we would have done things different had we known. And so we look at this, these two verses right here where it says that you don't know what tomorrow will bring. You don't know what your life will be for you are a bit of smoke that appears for a little while and then vanishes. And in comparison to eternity, we think about that eternity. Heaven is described to us as eternity. And inversely, hell is described as eternity. And we think about what our lifespan is in comparison to eternity. And eternity has been described best to me by Cameron Hoffman, who stated to me, eternity is so long that you no longer worry about time. I've never, I've never been able to describe it better than that. Eternity is such that you never worry about time. As people, we find ourselves worried about time all the, all, all the time. We find ourselves seeking out after how to maximize our time, how to minimize stress time and maximize fun time and maximize our existence and maximize our life and, and all these different things that we spend worrying about time. And it takes me back to... An interesting quote from uh, Avengers Endgame, one of the Marvel movies. And there comes a moment where Tony Stark is talking to his father. And he says, one of the things my dad taught me was that no amount of money could ever buy an ounce of time. And of course, in the span of the movie, it's dealing with time travel and issues like that. But we think about our lives today and how true is that statement. We don't realize when these moments pass us by that it is the last time. To quote one of Wilson Marsh's favorite television shows, The Office, one of the characters towards the end of the series says this, I wish you knew when the good old days were before they were the good old days. Because if we knew those last moments that we were going to talk to somebody and we knew that person didn't know Jesus, we would spend those last moments pleading with them about salvation. If we knew the last moment that we were going to put our child down and then never carry them again, we'd hold on for a little bit longer. If we knew, what would we do different? How would we be different? And we see the next statement here sort of gives us the idea in 15. It says this, instead you should, you should say, if the Lord wills and we live, we, or excuse me, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. And so we see that right there, that our statement should not be, oh, I've got my one, five, ten year plan. It should be that idea of if God allows, I hope to accomplish X, Y, Z. And some of you may think this sounds vaguely familiar because you may even use this statement of, well, Lord willing, I'll get to this. That's where this comes from. It's a colloquialism that we've taken from Scripture and added into our lives. The idea being that if God allows us to live long enough, this is what we would like to accomplish. That's a double-edged sword because if God allows us to live long enough to accomplish those things, the hope would be that through our relationship with Jesus, the things we would accomplish would not be about us, would be about advancing the kingdom of God. That it wouldn't be about us going and stockpiling more for ourselves and becoming more wealthy and more powerful and more this or more that, but that as God allows us more days on this earth, we would use those days to advance the kingdom, to see people saved. To see people come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. 
You look around and what's going on in our society right now, and that's what people need. As we talked about Sunday, if you've watched our Sunday message or if you were in person with us at church, I long for the day where we all use that universal language of worship where people come together in heaven worshiping, and it's that sweet sound of worship that becomes the universal language that speaks over everything else. We look at the next part here, it says this. So in 16 it says, But as it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. So for the person who knows to do good and doesn't, it is a sin. Church, that hits us should hit us right between the eyes. We would, we're boastful in our arrogance. And the person who knows to do good and doesn't do it is sinning. Church, we know the good. Church, we know what the good is. We know the good is Jesus. And if we're not doing everything we can to live up to his example and to be more like him and less like the world, And to see others come to know him by sharing the gospel, by sharing the truth of our relationship with him. If we're not doing that, then we're sinning. And the worst thing about it is, is that we know better. Because we know how good Jesus is. We know how all-encompassing and how powerful and how mighty the saving grace of Jesus Christ is, and how dare us not share that word with those around us that we would call friend. Not to mention those that that we wouldn't even consider friend, but those that we would call friend or family, that we wouldn't share that with them. How dare us hold on to that thing that is good. Church, I don't know what the future holds, but I know who holds the future. I don't know what's coming around the bend for this virus situation, for the other situations going on in our country, for the the uprisings and things we see happening. Church, I don't know. But I know that Jesus is the answer. I don't 100% know what the question is, but I know the answer is Jesus. And when I think about that and I say that the answer is Jesus, I have to think about his attributes and his ministry. What does that mean? Well, Jesus was grace and mercy and love. That we would love those around us as Jesus loved us. That we would sacrifice for one another. That we would share the gospel message with those around us, that we would be the hands and feet of Jesus to those around us, showing his example through our salvation, that maybe we would see someone who doesn't know the Lord come to know the Lord. Because I can tell you, you look around at what's going on in our country, and there's a lot of scared people. A lot of scared people doing things that scared people do. Because they don't have any hope. They need hope. They need the grace and the mercy and the love of Jesus. And it's on us, church. It's on us to be the hands and feet, to do what we've been called to do. Because James 4, 17 tells us, For the person who knows to do good and doesn't do it, it is a sin. Church, it's time for us to do the good. Do good. Let us pray. God, we thank you for the ability to meet. We thank you for the grace and the mercy you give us, even though we don't deserve it. God, we pray for the situations going on in our country and our world, for those that are scared and doing things that people do when they're scared. We pray that you would give them peace, that you would remove fear and bring courage. God, that you would rise up brothers and sisters in Christ in Christ around them 
to share the gospel, to share the good news of your son, Jesus Christ, to offer them grace and mercy and love that comes through a saving knowledge of your son, Jesus Christ. God, we thank you that you loved us enough to save us from ourselves. God, I pray that we would do the good you have called us to do because we know better. It's in your son's precious and holy name I pray. Amen. Well, church, thank you for hanging out with us tonight. Uh, remember, if you or anyone around you is in need, let, uh, reach out to us, let us know so we can do what we can to help out. Obviously, if you're in the Lytle, San Antonio area, we'd love to have you in person with us at Trinity Baptist Church, Sunday mornings, 11 a.m. You are welcome to come hang out with us. We appreciate you, those that have been coming. We appreciate you, those that are watching on here. Uh, we're encouraging you, if you're watching online with us, like and subscribe the page. It helps us get the word out, helps spread out the, the, these messages a little bit, gets it out there a little bit wider audience. And so that's if you want to help us out, uh, that is a huge help to like and subscribe, like the videos and subscribe to the page. Uh, helps out a lot as far as the spread goes for these videos. Uh, church, with that in mind, remember we love you and there's absolutely nothing you can do about that. And until, in, in, until we see you again, stay safe.